This PowerPoint slideshow reflects what happens when we read the original illustrated text of Twain. The slides are sometimes synchronized with what I say, and sometimes the slides offer a different narrative. We could shut our eyes and just listen to what I say, but by looking at the slides, we might note that other things are being transmitted. A different narrative, even a different story, are being given to us. Illustrations in Twain operate the same way. He writes, and the illustrator interprets something else, emphasizes something else. It's a bit disorienting to even think about this. Twain sure knew how to write, but what his publishers and his illustrators did was to change how we perceived the stories that he gave us. It's true, of course, that traveling for Twain became a bit annoying, in part because of the annoying people he met, and because he found civilization increasingly corrupt and even evil. He actually wanted to find an oasis somewhere, a home perhaps, which the Quaker City became for him in Innocence Abroad. Twain's fascination with a place like Quarry Farm can be found this early in his life, which speaks to his sense that while travel is useful, a nostalgic trip home is even better. Quite a few scholars have noted in passing that Twain's works are participating in the growth of what we would call graphic novels or even comic books. That's possible to be sure, but I think that Twain was simply trying to find ways of selling his works in the most interesting ways that his century could do in terms of technology. I wonder how he would respond to an internet text, a story that would show hyperlinked footnotes to words that needed explanation or to cultural references that might be obscure, along, of course, with the YouTube videos that accompany the written text. Beverly David and Bruce Michelson provide the background for this review of Twain's collaboration with illustrators. Others have, ha have of course, commented on Twain's use of illustrations. I'm adding a few notes here to supplement what they have so carefully discussed. Twain was not always a relaxed traveler, just there for the ride. He commented on the ills of society and challenged the ways people think. He found fault with average tourists, even when he realized that these average tourists were his readers. Innocence Abroad, while it mocked standard tourist guidebooks, also recognized the fragility of the global British Empire and warned about an expansionist American culture, even at the same time as having fun being a tourist. While I do touch on roughing up, and a tramp abroad here. I want to emphasize his last travel work following the equator, primarily because the illustrations match Twain's uneasy evaluation of civilization, finding that he does not find colonial empires at all benevolent, rather repugnant in fact, something he attacks with as much satire as he can generate, given that he wrote following the equator under very trying circumstances. Before I provide a very brief history of the collaboration between Twain and his illustrators, I'd like to offer a few ways to classify the kinds of illustrations produced through Twain's text. First, illustrators attempt to reflect what Twain observed or experienced. This is fairly ordinary in terms of what an illustrator might do, just capturing, without any real change to the text, what Twain was writing about. I'm going too fast. My slides aren't catching up with me. There we go. Ordinary observation. Second, illustrators enhanced the text with their own interpretation of a moment in the story or narrative Twain was embedding as a reflection of his overall travel experiences. This represents a scene when the apparent cost for a meal in Innocence Abroad seems rather excessive and everyone is alarmed. This is only slightly different from my first way to categorize an illustration. This adds a layer of interpretation, of course, but does not convey a sentiment that is different from a sense of comedic relief or exaggeration. There's no real satire here. Third, illustrations are introduced as a running commentary on the text, often serving as a highlighted emphasis. But here, the illustrator creates an additional narrative ideal, probably anticipating what Twain might have been trying to get at, but didn't really say. Sometimes these running commentaries exaggerate and change Twain's obvious meaning. Dan Beard is singularly known for changing Twain's satire about ancient England into a satire about the 19th century America. This is an illustration from a Connecticut Yankee. I hope, yes, there we go. And here's another illustration from Dan Beard. No, nope, that's Dan Beard, okay, fine. This third category is the one that most would like to spend a good deal of time on because these <laughs> illustrations stretch Twain's words a bit, but Twain's illustrators also observed several other conventions. Fourth, illustrations are used in a traditional tourist convention, that of showing reader, readers a picture of the place, such as a castle on the Rhine. Boy, I am reading too fast. Go on. Show us a picture of the Rhine, please. Whoops, it's Lake Como, rats. Oh, well. I'll get the Brian picture later sometime. Right. Hmm. There it is. <laughs> there it is. Okay. 
Well, that's, uh, some illustrations in this category are providing information useful for the tourist. This is similar to Rick Steves' current videos that glamorize individual towns, as to say, in, say, Europe. This makes the tourist want to see the place. Hmm. The publisher wanted to show something of interest while also being kind of informational. The following illustration, which was the previous one, of course, is actually useful for tourists in Australia who need to know that railroad tracks can be different as one traveled. The rails are just different sizes, so passengers have to move from one train track to system to another. This illustration sells the book's main ideas from the publisher's perspective. No, I'm going to have to wait on that one. Okay. Travel is an enjoyable experience. Okay. Fifth, illustrations from other sources were used as filler, that's a filler, without a genuine connection to Twain's words. Publishers did this as a common, if dubious, ethical practice way to use existing sources from other published works just to fill out an empty page. This occurred usually at the end of a chapter, but sometimes the publisher just used whatever was handy to add interest or fulfill one of the other aims of illustrations. Innocence Abroad, for example, included a steam steamship picture, Steamship in a sto Storm, which is not the Quaker City. Ah! I finally caught up with myself. Whoa, I'm feeling giddy. Sixth, and related to the second category of embedded images, illustrators merged the text of the image to invite the reader to track the visual image as an integral guide to the main idea being expressed by the words. Sometimes this subverts the reading process, but the illustration attempts to capture the physicality of what is being said. Imagine Twain's attempt to count the echoes that he hears in Innocence Abroad on one occasion in Milan, Italy. The publisher agreed that pretending to illustrate Twain's notebook as he dashed off 52 echoes would be interesting. A montage page, which you just are now looking at, which was a bit unusual in Twain's words, because photographs were challenging to incorporate until, until following the acquirer. They were quite novel at the time. This kind of image suggested the chaos of war. This illustration of mon or montage suggests a level of active realism not found in static images. You'll find this device in other texts, such as the following in the Kedike Yankee. Uh -huh. Nope, wrong text. Okay. It changes the reading pro process, but it makes Sir Denadan's joke more apparent as a physical one. And it makes this illustration from following the greater stretch of category into satire. Hmm. Now, I'm behind time. Twain had some fun with the whole notion of what, who could illustrate his text. He thought the reader might appreciate his own artistry. And he pretended that his good friend Joseph Twitchell was the artist Harris. Well, perhaps the perspectives of individuals on drawings might have been a little bit off, and perhaps a bit sketchy at best, but they were certainly informative. Well, perhaps not. Uh, geographic details useful for the traveler? Um, generally, Twain mocked con European conventions in his early work and later attacked what he saw as a global obsession with colonialism and empire building. He realized in his final journey abroad that many were still subject to forms of slavery and abject despair. Many were deprived of basic human rights. Illustrators amplified what Twain had to say. More importantly than that amplification and exemplification was the collaborative effort between Twain and his publisher. This collaboration produced two narratives, one the words and the other the images. We all read the words, of course, but the illustrations sometimes have an alternative message that we need to follow. Many readers have noted the nature of these travel texts, that they are part of the tradition of graphic novels. Twain does not prepare a guide for us to use as we travel. His travel works are closer to Tristram Shandy in terms of mocking serious literature and suggest Twain's coming to terms with himself as a writer, and yes, suggest that he's experimenting with how to clarify his role as a writer, grappling with his own identity in the context of what he remembers as he travels. The background is not that simple. Twain worked with his publisher, Elisha Bliss, closely on Innocence Abroad because he wanted to make money uh, using the subscription sales process, as much money as he could. Twain wasn't looking for fame as a literary figure, but he was looking for a fortune. As a printer's apprentice himself, Twain knew quite well the changes that were occurring in the publishing world. Twain's huge investment in page typesetter is a tale of his faith in the evolving revolution in American publishing, even if that was a very bad investment and using illustrations to sell his work as a natural part of his persona as a writer. The subscription sales method of marketing the book has been explained in thorough detail, so I'll simplify this here. The American publishing company, headed by Elisha Bliss in the early days, used sales agents who had traveled door to door with a sample text of a book, and these agents would hawk these prospective books with these samples, which included a set of the illustrations, often with a copy of the cover. Customers were then 
usually pay on an installment plan so that the overall cost of each book would not be a major factor in the decision to buy or not. Illustrations are key to the sale. The selected words mattered, of course, but only if the illustrations could be used to pitch the idea of the written text. Innocence Abroad, Twain's first travel book, needed to be exciting and new in what it covered. It's not a traditional travel text, something one could use as a guide to Paris or London. It attacks the tourist trade while elevating the American tourist as a practical individualist who finds Europe to be oversold and overdone and overly pretentious. It does more than that, just uh, than just that, of course, because it's a complicated travel book. The illustrations suggest that the publisher had most of the control of the illustrations, and Twain collaborated on yet another theme: that of the decline of European influence on the world and the growth of the American experiment. Basically, a waving banner of American exceptionalism. <sighs> Bliss chose the illustrators, sometimes borrowing from other texts from his own firm and from other sources. Major illustrators included True Williams and. Roswell Moore Shirtliff, Williams illustrating a number of later Twain texts, such as The Adventures of Tom Sawyer and Roughing It. Innocence Abroad was a learning experience for Twain. He gained considerable knowledge about the subscription trade business and recognized the importance of illustrations. Illustrations could capture the sense of the words while high highlighting significant passages and themes. Roughing It only deepened Twain's enthusiasm for illustrations, as Beverly David notes, pictures, pages, and profits now had a direct correlation for him. True Williams was first rejected as an illustrator because of his obvious alcoholism, Edward F. Mullen, the first choice. Mullen proved also to be something of a drunk, so Williams wound up doing most of the work. A Trump abroad is next. Twain had a bit more control in choosing his illustrators, but that gave Bliss some heartburn. Twain first bypassed the relation in search of more control of his book and arranged a secret contract with his son Frank, who Twain encouraged to set up his own publishing firm. Twain more or less hired Francis, Walter Francis Brown, a young artist studying in Paris, who proved to be a poor illustrator. Okay, child. Okay. Come on. Francis Brown. There we go. All right. Terrible illustration. Okay. Twain peddled his own sketches to Frank as something of a bonus, the writer illustrating his own words. True Williams and a number of other illustrators were hired by Frank Bliss to finish the work. Despite the intrusive interference from Twain, Bliss was able to produce A Tramp Abroad and turn a tidy profit. A Tramp Abroad is an experimental text, an anti-tourism book with very little helpful information about Europe or about how to travel. It continues the thread of American exceptionalism at the same time to satirize Americans who travel. Dan Beard, the key illustrator of the Connecticut Yankee and King Arthur's Court, worked on following the equator. Beard went beyond the satiric language of Twain and Yankee, much to Twain's approval, so the choice of Beard, along with others for following the equator, made this last travel work a success in Twain's eyes. This book included photographs, which was relatively still new in 1895 in terms of being an illustrated text. Twain approved the illustrations and the photographs as the book went through its usual process of publication. Not of the political theater that these illustrators imagined. Twain's identity as a national figure was developed by his travel text, to be sure, but illustrators helped create that identity by exaggeration and sometimes mockery. Here's an illustration from A Tramp Abroad that teases Twain's own version of himself as a traveler, of course, an illustration created by Twain as an artist. Here's an illustration. Here's an illustrator's portrayal of Twain in the same way of ridicule in Innocence Abroad. Of course, illustrators also attempted to find the serious side of Twain, as in this reflection of what it meant to be an author. Oh, off track. Which does capture the sense of finding a way of controlling the chaotic memories one might have of a trip. Here's a serious side of uh, Twain and Trump Broad. Twain's memories are a swirl of activity and thought. This illustration suggests that it might apply to innocence abroad more than a tramp abroad. Innocence abroad, generally speaking, is an anti-travel travel text, arguing that the traveler ought to be observing different cultures without depending on Baedeker guides, which provide a roadmap of what to see and what to do. No, Twain's first travel work claims that a true American would look with fresh eyes on the travel experience, and to some degree, the American landscape should always be the focal point that the return home was the best thing to the trip itself. A Tramp Abroad is upset as experimental, trying to find a new way to deal with the tourist experience, and again, generally speaking, this is a satire about any kind of travel text, and as many have noted, undercuts the conventions of any type of travel work, 
becoming a bit of an eclectic mix of folklore, cultural observations, and self-deprecating observations about life, notably losing a sense of real purpose. That may help explain the swirl of thoughts in this illustration. The illustrator seems to have figured this out. Following the equator is kind of easy in terms of seeing how the illustrator is caught on Twain's drift. This is a text meant to get him out of debt, but Twain also used the journey as a way to express his dismay over the continuing slide toward depravity in the so-called civilization. He is fascinated with the Boer War, the urge toward declaring oneself free from colonialism, but he particularly got angry about the treatment of Aborigines in Australia and the treatment of natives in America. This is a father. Uh, next slide, please. Yes. This is a father looking at what remains of his daughter, a photograph used in a different kind of text by Twain. The political theater, if one can call it at this point, is stark and real, not at all like earlier illustrations that tend to mock and ridicule the white man's rule. Illustrators exaggerated some, but seem to have read Twain correctly. That the culture of the white civilization, European and American, was awful and had to be revealed for what it was, a cesspool of racism and slavery. While well, photographs are used to uh, demonstrate the isolation of natives, such as the last of her race, Twain does applaud the culture of India, particularly the clothing and color used there and in Ceylon. Here the illustration notes the nostalgia Twain feels for what appears to have meant to him to be a memory of a southern past. However, he also feels, and the illustrator managed to uh, convey this sentiment as well, that this nostalgia is misplaced and awkward. The illustrator presents Twain as an example of a colonialist, someone with wealth and power. Noticing the people walking. Okay. <clears throat> Twain's commentary about the clothing that's it that he sees on native children in Africa reveals an uneasiness about the clothing that they are forced to wear by the white establishment figures shown in the following illustration. Dan Beard isn't the only illustrator who explains Twain's text while explaining in the raw satiric edge, but he's a singular interpreter of what he reads from Twain. The following image refers to an extinct bird, the moa, and is derived from a few lines from an early description in Following the Equator. There we go. Yes. This an image anticipates much of the scorn that Twain reflects later for the classic tourist incapable of understanding a different culture. Twain's collaboration with his illustrators does vary with the publisher, but the accounts of these efforts suggest that Twain had the most influence in what was used as an illustration in Innocence Abroad and Tramp Abroad. Dan Beard's work in following the crater probably had Twain's approval, reflecting and also exaggerating the anger that Twain felt toward colonialism and white culture, particularly the European influence globally. Are these travel works then graphic novels because they use illustrations freely and the character named Mark Twain appears in all of them? Well, not really, though Trampa Rod comes closest to using a great deal of fiction as observed about Europe. But yes, the art of illustration enhances the text. It's quite apparent in the adventures of Huckleberry Finn and Twain realized that, mo that only words would not suffice. One cannot really read only the words without considering the other visual er narrative that occurs. The illustrations, though from a variety of artists and from a variety of interpretations, become an alternate version of Twain, what, what train Twain wrote, well, and sometimes suggest an angrier or more severe critic of civilization. Twain unhinged. The self-mockery one finds in A Tramp of Raw is gone largely, though illustrators in Following the Equator are still keen on keeping Twain in place. Jeff Steinbrook's paper on quantum mechanics from Thursday captures what I intend to argue here, that there are a number of Twains who coexist at the same time at the same place. If you found Twain's face in the train station illustration, which just flashed by, you might note that he almost disappears among the servants in India. He's part of the crowd of uh, subjects for England's empire, but he also can tell their stories. He's our, our iconic Mark Twain, a famous traveler, and also a voice for those unique, for their unique culture. At the same time, he is angry about the colonialization that occurs and enslaves so many in Africa and elsewhere. Somehow, an illustrator managed to show Twain as a multiple self, a figure one can ridicule at the same time 
elevates to a satiric voice.